Buddha's basic image for the teaching he taught was a path. It's a path you follow. And it has a goal. It's meant to take you someplace. The teachings are not there simply to entertain you or to impress you. They're to get to you, to make you look at the way you're living your life. Because as the Buddha noticed, everybody's following a path of one kind or another. But for the most part, people don't know where those paths are leading. There's some paths that seem very nice, he said, but they can lead to burning pits of charcoal, cesspools, places you really wouldn't want to go. Other paths lead to a nice place under the shade of a good tree, a protected mansion. So look at the path you're following, and then compare it with the path that the Buddha recommends. As we chant every day, every day, this path is admirable in the beginning, admirable in the middle, admirable in the end. In other words, you look at the theory, the way he describes it in the very beginning, and you see that it starts with a problem that really is worth solving, the problem of suffering. There are so many other philosophies, so many other religions that start with stranger problems. But this one everyone can see is immediate. People suffer. And he gives an analysis to show that the suffering comes from within, which means that you're in a position where you can change what it is that's causing the suffering. So many people say that the teaching is pessimistic because it focuses on suffering. But that's not the case at all. I mean, the whole point of this is that you can put an end to suffering, which is very optimistic. It gives you hope. There's a way out. And it's within your power. If somebody else were making you suffer and they were beyond your power, you'd, that would be very pessimistic. Over simply built into the way things are that everybody has to suffer. A teaching that was actually taught at the time of the Buddha, and that you hear sometimes today, saying, well, we live in this world of suffering and just have to learn how to put up with it, learn how to accept it, make your mind at peace, and it'll be okay. Well, it's not okay. The suffering is still suffering. And if we're in that position, that would be pessimistic. But the Buddha is saying it. The suffering comes from a cause, something you're doing, but you can change what you're doing. Now it's going to go against the grain because, as he said, it's from our craving that we suffer. And we lack our cravings. But he's asking you to step back and look at them and see what they do. And if you can develop some dispassion for them, that's how you can put an end to them. And there's a path to practice that he explains. He sets it out like a, a doctor's diagnosis of illness. These are the symptoms, these are the causes. It is possible to put it into to the disease by attacking the causes, and here's how you do it. In this case, it's the Eightfold Path, which can be summarized in three sections. There's virtue, there's concentration, and there's discernment. all of which are good things to develop. That's the beginning, just learning about the theory. Then there's the actual practice. And that's admirable, too, as you put these principles into, into practice. You learn a lot about yourself. You change your environment. And you find that you have potentials within yourself that you didn't know before. Here again, it's not just a matter of accepting what's there. You try to figure out what are the potentials here. What is your potential for mindfulness, say? What is your potential for concentration? How do you go about developing those potentials? Well, as the Buddha said, you commit yourself to what the practice says, and then you reflect. Because the knowledge is not going to come simply from listening to what he had to say. 
becomes from putting, putting his instructions into, into practice. And then watching yourself, judging, is this really working? Otherwise, what's good about this path is that it develops your powers of observation. The Buddha wanted a student, he said, who was honest and observant to begin with. And he's going to take those two qualities and develop them in the path. So you're doing this path not simply to please somebody else or to obey them. You're doing this so that you can, you can learn how to pass judgment on it yourself. And you're going to be trained to be really good at passing judgment, in other words, reliable. After all, you're asked to develop what qualities? Mindfulness, alertness, ardency, under right mindfulness. Those are all good thing, things to have in mind, good qualities to have. So I do that by staying with the breath, keeping the breath in mind, and then watching the breath coming in and going out, and then trying to do it well. Doing it well means learning how to breathe with a sense of ease, with a sense of fullness, learning how to breathe with a sense of being aware of the whole body, calming the effect that the breath has on the body. Breathing in a way that allows you to see how your perceptions and your feelings are having an impact on the mind, and learn how to calm that impact. So energizing the mind when it needs to be energized, steadying it when it needs to be steadied, releasing it from its burdens when it needs to be released. You do all this by developing that quality of committing to the practice and then reflecting what you're doing. Because the Buddhist meditation instructions answer a lot of questions, but they also raise a lot of questions. They give you ideas about where you should look, what you should try to do. But a lot of it's going to depend on you to develop your own powers of observation and your own honesty about what's working and what's not working. And this includes your powers of ingenuity to figure things out. So that's the path in the middle, the admirable in the middle, because it trains you to be an observant, reliable person. And then it's admirable in the end. As the Buddha promises, there is a happiness that's totally independent of conditions. Now you might say, well, aren't we doing the path? Isn't the path giving rise to that goal? The path doesn't give rise to the goal. It's like a road to a mountain. The road doesn't cause the mountain, but you follow the road and you get there. Or to look at it another way, if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, if you're coming from the south, you know there are two ways, straight from the south and then over and from the southeast. And sometimes the path is like the road straight from the south. It goes on in a very flat area. You have no notion that there's any canyon anywhere nearby. And then all of a sudden you hit the edge of the canyon, and it's huge. The road from the southeast follows what's called the Little Colorado River. And it does follow a canyon, and the canyon is interesting. And you can see that it's getting deeper and deeper. And then finally it, too reaches the Grand Canyon, which is immensely larger than the Little Colorado River Canyon. But at least on that side you're getting a sense of, yeah, there is a canyon around here. In other words, sometimes as you're practicing, you don't see anything that would indicate there's anything deathless at the end of this. It's just a lot of work. But you read the guidebooks and they say, keep on going north, going north. So you keep at it. Other times you can see, okay, the mind is getting more stable, it's getting more reliable. Its sense of well-being gets stronger. Whether you're meditating or not, there's a sense that your mind has lowered its center of gravity, so it's not pushed over so easily. So 
So there are ways that you can begin to see that this path is going in a good direction. But when you get to the goal, it's something totally other. The path is fabricated, the goal is unfabricated. In other words, you didn't put it together. It's there. And John Lee's analogy is of trying to get fresh water out of salt water. There is water in the salt water, but you have to submit, apply some heat, then you can distill it, and then you've got fresh water. Where was the fresh water to begin with? It was there in the salt water. But you aren't going to get the fresh water simply by taking the salt water and letting it sit. Because the salt was not going to separate out on its own. So it's already there, it's already there. Simply it takes some effort to find it, to work at cleaning away the impurities of the mind. And then you reach something that's totally other. And everyone who's experienced it says with one voice, it's the ultimate happiness, the ultimate security. And the Buddha had forty-some names for it that indicate, one, it is a type of consciousness. You're not blanking out. He calls it consciousness without surface. The image is of a sunbeam. If it lands on something, you can see the light. We look out into outer space, and a lot of it looks black. But every spot that looks black to us actually has light going through it, simply that it's not reflecting off of anything so you don't see it. The same with the consciousness of Nibbana. It's not reflected by anything, but it is a kind of consciousness. Secondly, it's true. In other words, it doesn't change. It's not something fabricated into being. That's going to fall apart when the fabrications fall apart. It is blissful. And it's free. In fact, the word nibbana comes from an image that they used to describe how fire went out. Their view of fire was that there was a fire element latent in everything. And when you provoked it, the fire would appear. And as it was burning, it was clinging to its fuel, and it was stuck in its fuel because it was clinging. When it goes out, it lets go. And so the image there, it's free because it lets go. It's not the case that the five aggregates are holding on to us and keeping us down. We're the ones clinging to them, and that's what's keeping us down. So the freedom is going to come from learning how to let go. And then finally, excellence. This really is amazing. It really is something totally other and above, beyond anything else you've ever experienced. So that's the admirable goal. So this is the path that the Buddha offers. Admirable in the beginning, admirable in the middle, admirable in the end. And it's open to everybody. It's not a toll road. But it does require a lot of effort and a lot of dedication. But it's more than repaid. So look at the path that you're following in your own life and ask yourself, is this the path I want? Is this the best path I could I could manage? Is there something better? And the Buddha says, here is a better path. So you might want to give it a try. <laughs>